So this is um, an exa the example I actually use in the slides. So I have various things here. I'll actually just clean out those things. So what I have in here is dictionary.lex, which is a token definition, dictionary.y. These are actually the lecture slides and these are various other things. But if I look at um, dictionary.lex, then um, here is a definition of my lexa. Um, I've got three, four kinds of tokens, two of which uh, um, have no attributes, so it's just a code on a comma. One of which is a number, um, for which I'm actually going to have a, a numeric attribute. Another of which is an identifier, for which I'm going to have a string attribute. Um, tied up with that, or coupled with that, is going to be a um, oops. Um, as well as that, I have my um, bison or yak file. Um, so this is slightly more complicated because it's actually defining both the parser and what we're going to do with the thing as we parse it. So at the top, I've got my sort of user code, the C code that's going to be embedded in this parser. So at the top, I'm including standard I.O. because I'm going to use printf and things like that. Underneath, I'm defining the data structure that I'm going to build. Um, because, I'm because I'm parsing pairs of keys and values, I have a list data type, which consists of a string, which is the name, uh, a value, which is the, the number associated with, the, associated with that name, and another list node, because this is a, a linked list I'm building. Now I've got a helper function that I'm declaring here because I'm going to use this thing, make pair, within the actual grammar. It's going to be used in one of the actions. Other things I have is um, paired up with the attributes of my lexa, I'm declaring in my parser that certain things have certain attributes. So if I find... Um, So if I've got my lexer up versus my um, parser, then on the left hand side you can see that I've got number, string and node star are the three types of attributes. Um, on the right hand side, the lexer only produces things with numbers or string attributes. And that's because those are the only things that correspond to terminals. These node attributes correspond to non-terminals within the um, grammar. So they're the, the more complex things I want to build up. So now I've declared the attributes, that, the possible attributes for any kind of um, terminal or non-terminal. Um, here I'm declaring tokens, and these directly correspond to the um, things on the, in the actual lexa. So I've got colon, comma, and then at the end of here, I've got number, string. So colon, comma, number, string, and on the other side, colon, comma, string, number. Um, those are my terminals or my tokens. I also need to think about all of the non-terminals and terminals are going to have attributes. Some of these are obvious, like the terminal token uh, num is going to have an attribute of type num which means that the value is going to end up here um, and string is obviously string but for non-terminals like pair and pair list the type of their attribute is actually going to be this thing of type node because they're going to be building up a, a data structure and then um, last thing i need is to actually define a start symbol which is where the grammar will start and kind of my start tree which is the tree I'm going to build before I've actually added anything to it. So my grammar, um, the actual grammar, sort of the, the BNF and the actions, is actually only three rules because I've only got three interesting non-terminals. So a pair simply consists of a string given a name and a number given a value separated by a colon. And you can read this just as straight um, BNF. The action associated with that is I want to make a pair. And that pair is going to consist of the value itself. So $1 is um, the name here. 
and the value of the number which is dollar three which is associated with him. So we have dollar one, dollar two, dollar three. I want to make a pair that consists of the name and the number. And this dollar dollar thing represents, you can think of it as the thing associated with the pair on the left hand side. The action for our start symbol is slightly different. All we say is a start is a pair list and um, it can be anything that a pair list can be. Here I'm just using this action to say if I've built up a pair list on the right hand side then in order to do that final match I assign this global variable root to whatever it is I've built up. Um, this is actually well typed as it were because the type of pair list is node, the type of start is node so if I take the attribute here, I can assign it to um, the root, which is also of type node star, pair star. The only moderately complicated thing here is for pair list because we've got um, either you can have more things in the list or you can have the end of the list. So the type of pair list is node. The type of pair is node. So each of these things represents a node star. So this thing here is going to be called $1, which is what I've got over here. This thing is going to be $3, $2 we don't actually need. So $$ is the result of this thing. So I'm going to say that the result of this thing is the first list. And all I'm going to do is say that the first list should point towards the next thing. So I'm just hooking up a linked list there. For the base case here, I'm going to say that a pair is simply the result of a pair is the pair itself. This is of type node star, this is of type node star, so we're okay. So that's all of the declarations and our very, very simple grammar. Then here is the actual code. Here is the, the sort of main function that will run. I've included standard i at h again. It doesn't really hurt. It just um, means it will be included twice. Here is my helper function I declared right at the top and that I'm using here and all it does is this is C so I'm not um, casting things I malloc up a data structure that will hold this this pair I set the name to whatever it was we found from the first part I'll set the value to whatever it was we found in the second part and I'll set next to null because this is the end of the list by default um, and that's pretty much it for the grammar itself and the actions needed. The only final thing I want is something to, that will walk this tree. So given a node, I want a function that will print everything in there, um, which is just a recursive function that walks along the list. And then I have this thing, um, my main driver function, which has a little bit of login. It parses things. And then if it succeeds in parsing, it prints it out. And that's basically it. So that's my complete Lexa and uh, my complete parser and my complete Lexa. So if I now want to compile these, I need to use Bison or Yak or something. So if I try running Bison, um, I don't currently have Bison. I can bring it in. And now I have bison. So I can say bison to look for information about bison, or I can more reasonably go through and get the documentation for bison using man. And obviously, it does actually say how you run these things. If you can't work out how to make bison do something, the man page is actually a good place to start, probably before places like Stack Overflow, because uh, you'll actually see opportunities you might not know about in here. Um, so if I say I'm going to bison my um, dot .y file, the dot .y file is because this is based on yak and there's the whole joke about bison yak, whatever. So if I now compile this, what it's given me is this thing um, dictionary.tab.c. So if I open that up, then there's lots of stuff. There's the GPL exception, it's kind of interesting. Um, and then you find all these things like YYs and it looks a bit like one of the Lexes inside. Um, if we go down, 
then we get tables which are telling us something about how we actually um, run the state machine, the push down automata this thing, on. well no you shouldn't say that, it's not actually push down automata. Um, so there is an automata. Then all the way down we're going to get, this is all sort of boilerplate stuff, right at the bottom we have the code that we put at the end of our um, at the end of our uh, dictionary.y we have various things up here so some error handling is somewhere up here we should be able to see our code being pasted in although it might be easier to search for it um, ah, there we go so here is an action saying yyval.node is yyvsp-2.node arrow next yyvsp0 this is dollar $1, this is dollar $3, this is dollar dollar. So you can actually see one of the actions um, that you put in here. Um, here's another one of our actions embedded in here. So dollar dollar equals make there, dollar one, dollar three. And you can see it's pulling out the right attributes based on the types of these different things. So we're doing some relatively sophisticated analysis in there. And ab above that, there's yeah all kinds of um, parser stuff that's created for you. Um, if we look at our flex implementation or our flex parser, one of the things we need is we want to include dictionary.tab.h and that's because somebody has to define what colon, comma, num and string are. And as it happens, dictionary.tab, where we look, just looked at dictionary.tab.c, Dictionary.tab.h is something created by Bison. At the moment, we don't have that. We just have .tab.c. So if I look for um, Bison, go down, I'm looking for something to do with headers, then output minus defined also produces a header file. So if we try that, um, I'll put it before. We now have dictionary.tab.h, and if I look in that, um, we're going to see lots of licensing things, and you can actually see the declarations that we put at the top of our um, parser have been put here, and it actually now gives us values for colon, comma, string, and num, and these are the things that will be included in the um, flexor. Okay, so now we're in a position to run the flex. So flex is going to be based on this dictionary.lex. So if I try flex dictionary.flex, I don't have flex. I install flex. And yep, so I got flex now and obviously I can do man flex as well and I get nicely formatted. Things. I can probably do info flex as well and you get um, hyperlinked stuff. Um, so I want to do flex and it's going to be dictionary.lex. So that's run. And what I have out is um, as a produce lex.yy.c. Um, I might not be desperately happy with lex.yy.c, so I could go in and say, what do I actually want to call this thing? And I think I can put in minus O. So I could say um, minus O dictionary.yy.c. Oh, that's okay. Maybe I have to put it before. Ah, has to come before. Um, oh, sorry. Dot yy dot c. Okay. So now we have dictionary dot yy dot c. I'm going to get. Yeah, that's okay. 
Um, so now I should be able to compile all these things together. So if I do, um, this is all C, GCC, dictionary dot tab dot C, dictionary dot yy dot C, then it compiles. And I have um, a dot out, which is my executable because it has the X bit set. So if I run now, run a dot out. Remember I had it printed out main just as this debugging thing to show it's running. Um, so but, uh, I cannot remember the syntax that I said the grammar had. Let's try X5 uh, syntax error. Um, no, that's wrong. Um, so my syntax is string colon num and that's a pair. So it needs to be comma. So if I look at my tokens, oops. Oh, there we go. I should have put speech marks in. So my parser was quite correctly pointing out that what I was putting in was invalid. So there I've put something in um, and it's consumed it because it's waiting for more things. And if I put in, so I've got a syntax error there because I didn't separate it with um, commas. So if I try again, this time I put a comma in. And this is gonna keep on reading more and more input until I uh, tell it it's finished. Um, so what it's waiting for is an end of file signal. So if I give that by pressing control D, then it says end of file. And now what we can see printed out is the, the result of all of that. So there was a value x and it had, there wasn't a, uh, a value called x and it had the number five. There was something called y, y, y and it had um, 10. Um, and no matter how I put these things in, so if I do, I can sort of squish them up. Um, or I can say, it doesn't really mind, then it still prints them out. Um, ooh, has it, it missed out 10. Ooh, maybe there's a bug in my logic. Um, what was that? Put X and G, oh, I think I might have wired it up incorrectly. Um, so if I, now discover that there's a bug in my um, parser, which apparently there is. Um, one thing I could do is I could run through this dance of saying, um, well, I have to run bison before I run flex because this thing produces something that's going to be used. Well, I don't technically have to. Um, then I'd want to run flex and then I'd want to compile it every time. Rather than doing that, I'd be inclined to um, create a make file. So this is just those those commands um, saying, given dictionary.y, I can run this command to produce dictionary.tab.c and dictionary.tab.h. Um, given dictionary.lex, I can run flex to get dictionary.yy.c. Given that all of these things exist, I can run this command to get something called dictionary <laughs> rather than a.out. So, um, so I could now say make dictionary and it will do those things behind the scenes to actually make it. And if I run it again, it, it doesn't run it again. If I want to force it to update things, I could do make minus B and then it will actually run all of these different things um, and if I modify one of these things so if I say that dictionary has been changed so touch update updates the timestamp then I run it again with not with minus b and it runs just flex and gcc but it doesn't bother running bison again uh, yeah so that's parsing lexing and building up a data structure